Welcome back to another episode of SAS Buyers Club. I'm your host, Omid, and I'm here with Adrian Kaler. He's mm-hmm. spelled his name phonetically for us. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> Omid, so good to be here, man. Yeah, great to have you. And tell us, tell us a little bit uh, about you, Adrian. Sure. Who is, who is it? Who, who are you? What do you do? What can Adrian, people learn from you today? Adrian Kaler. Let's see. I'm a dude. Live out in Los Angeles. I've been out here 20 years, almost 44 years old. I've been in this space. This space is uh, business consulting, focusing on coaching and training of leaders, aligning teams. I've been doing this for just over a dozen years. It is my passion. Didn't always do this. Very bullet point background. I was a pre-med guy in college, ended up saying, I don't want to do all those years of school. And I, man, I'm not that objective. I'm not that little. Let's just look at the data and do research. I like being in the trenches. So I actually got a nursing degree, moved to Chicago, grew up in Illinois, moved to Chicago, worked in the pediatric intensive care unit. So saving kids' lives every day was thrilling and heartbreaking when it didn't work. But being with the families, that's what I really love the most, like being with and supporting, creating that space, if you will, where a freaked out mom and a freaked out dad could actually be there and connect and do something productive and not listen to their survival brain, but really be warriors and stand up. And so the art of that job is what I really love, the relational art of helping people find themselves and make great decisions in chaos. Came from a faith-based background, not that religious, never been that religious, but loved some of the themes and loved what happens when people get around a mission that matters. So I, I moved, ended up moving to Los Angeles to work with a guy named Erwin McManus, who runs a church out here called Mosaic. It was very progressive at the time. And love that. Did that for several years. And I was mostly the guy that would build teams and mobilize people for service in the city and globally. I would take tons of teams overseas. And I just loved it. I'd, I'd meet anybody that's a professional, hear about what they care about. And I know a nonprofit in town that you can make two hours of your time could change their world and change their budget. Would you do that? Would you come in? And they would always, I would just always tell them, if you give me an hour of your week, it'll be your favorite hour of the week. So I've always been interested in helping people have more meaning in their lives, have more impact and be aligned, right? Have integrity in that, that kind of way. Um, did that for a good while, loved it, spoke all over the world just because Erwin was a big dog and didn't want to travel everywhere. So he sent out young punks like me. So grateful for that. Um, speaking about leadership and entrepreneurial leadership, it's wonderful. And if you can lead volunteers, you can lead people you pay. So learn in the school of hard knocks around how to motivate people around intrinsic value and uh, loved that. Uh, Through that, met a guy whose father was a billionaire. So he was a millionaire. He had his own spiritual transformation and he wanted to start giving his money away. And I was well connected and I was happened to be the guy that met him and helped him come to faith and all that stuff. So he asked me to help him figure that out and took him around the world. Uh, He wasn't at all connected with the the outside world really. And uh, we ended up working with people who had really blown it and needed a second chance. That started with Homeboy Industries in downtown LA that some people are familiar with. Mm-hmm. We put a cafe for them in City Hall. So today, below one floor below the mayor's office, there are ex-cons serving coffee, uh, which I just think is beautiful. And uh, But then we did a majority of our work in the prison system, mostly at Soledad State Prison here in California. We worked with lifers. So all the guys who had murdered someone, usually when they were in their mid-teens, and now I met them 20 years later. And you've met some of these guys. And we went in and ran a leadership training with them, like a three-day leadership intensive. And then we trained the select few to be trainers. And then they would run their own training. So they were the ones speaking instead of outside people. And it was breathtaking work. The recidivism rate is what they calculate in that world, like chance of someone going back to prison after getting out. And it's high. It's 87% mm-hmm. because prisons are criminal factories. If you're not that criminal coming in, you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. It will turn you into a criminal. Be, and you must because it's just gang warfare. But after the, the, all the, the longitudinal study we do, we track everyone that came out of our trainings. Uh, it goes from 87% down to 12%. Wow. And why? Because the crux of that training is the distinction between a victim mindset and a responsible mindset. And once somebody gets the freedom from taking responsibility instead of the relief from playing the victim, they're actually alive maybe for the first time ever. And then they can actually have power to move and power to reconcile, power to forgive, and then start serving, which is you know, where they spent most of their time, serving other people. They became the leaders in the prison with not just, not the leaders that some of them had been before where they're running guns and, or sorry, drugs and contraband, all that stuff, cell phones. But now 
leading with integrity and with honor and dignity. And all of them, all of them got out the next time they went to the parole board, 100%, just because wow. they'd shifted. They'd shifted. So did that work for a good amount of time. I loved it. The guy that gave the money wanted to focus on that one population. I'm a guy that likes to go big or go home. So I said, I love you. Thank you. It's all set up now. Hired my replacement and then got into this coaching work because in that process, I'd gone through all the trainings I could go through and went through a coach's academy and, and with this guy, Dan Tacchini that you know, and and he's world class. He's been in this game for 40 years. And so he was my OB1 and mutual deep respect eventually started a company with him. So we've been doing this company called Take New Ground for several years now. And anyway, Dan's fantastic. I love this work. I love getting out there, meeting new people. I love doing the work. We're known for our loving edge. So we're not content guys where it's like, hey, here's the five steps, the blah, blah, blah. There's lots of great people that do that and you should listen to them. That's just not me or what we think is really going to last. Where are they, What do you not want to talk about? And that's what we're going to talk about, team. So mm -hmm. we get to it and, and unapologetically, we know that business results come from relationships. So the more you get clear and get connected in relationships, the more results can happen. You might have a stupid strategy, you need to change your strategy, but a great strategy with a toxic culture is a bad strategy. It's not going to work. It's not going to be sustainable. So we, for people that like to be driven and ambitious and, and no holds barred, and these people are stupid, they should just get smart. It's like, it's a whole different way of relating to other people that's actually more meaningful, but it's just more risky. So most people won't do it. So that's what we focus on. And what do you want listeners today to know? Like what's something you want them to know? What? That's a fun question. What do I want them to know? Huh? Let's see. I want, if you're listening to this, thanks for listening. I think you're, it's a good choice. I trust Omid. What do I want you to know? That life's really short. Nothing's promised. Whatever is going on between your ears about yourself, about your company, about the market, everything is shiftable. If you've got the courage to stand up and ask better questions. And my experience is I need someone else to see the questions I need to be asking because we're the fish in the water, you know, metaphor. So what I want you to know is whatever's going on, there is an exponential alternative, but it's natural that you don't know what it is. So you could talk to me or my team about that or get somebody else in your world that'll help you wonder about what's possible for you. That will be riskier, but a lot more satisfying. And I would say a lot more profitable. I love that. That's what I need. Yeah. That's what I talk to myself all the time. I mean, I'm my own first client, right? And I'm squirrely, man. And, you know, talented and blah, blah, blah. But man, it, it's... It, get off the get off the path rather quickly and i know i'm not alone in that but it, that's what it takes for me is like getting myself clear on a daily basis if not even hourly you know just because especially in times of chaos and there's lots coming at you as an entrepreneur and there's many shiny objects to go run after so you know i need that type of grounding in my life so i'm always smoking what i'm selling here <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Oh, I do. I do. Yeah. brother. I smell it. I smell it. I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So I love that. What I took away from what you said is everything's shiftable. Yep. And we need to be able to ask better questions, be able to shift. And one of the ways to ask better questions is to work with people who help us ask those better questions, who yeah. can bring out those better questions from us right on right on and it could be a great friend i mean some of us have friends like that that love us enough to tell us the truth and are have distinct ways of looking and thinking about things so if that's your friend great go do that but it's also people pay us good money to come in and help them shift their perspective on reality yeah. inside their business and so that they get roi for that that's why they keep signing up for years and years because it's always a new game it's always a new game, no matter what's happening, new year, new team member, new industry shift or whatever. There's always something new. And that's one I would say culture is the leader's number one job. If you mm -hmm. get that straight, there's all the strategy aligns and actions align. Culture meaning the, co the context of conversation, like all of what's unsaid that's going on in any meeting. If you've got a staff meeting on Monday at 10 a.m., there's things that are talked about and then there's things that are talked about but aren't out loud. But all of that is culture. And if you can become a, a maven at an expert at illuminating the invisible, 
and getting it into language so people then can move it and shake it and, and twist it and, and realign it. And, and that's, that's, you'll be special. You'll be distinct. People will trust you and they'll stay with you because you care about them. That's what it lands is care because you're actually, I was going to say reading people's minds. It's not that way. You're, you're predicting based on what's happening, what is going on with someone and what they might be scared to talk about, unwilling to talk about. But if you can provoke that to the surface with love and concern and an edge, it's okay. If like, you know, if someone is on their way out the door and you think they are, and you know, you find, you know, a way to talk about it, that's significant if they leave definitely significant if they leave poorly. So you need to be able to illuminate that, which actually makes it a, a game between the two of you instead of just a private conversation and a private fear for you probably. But if you do that, you're going to stand out because most people aren't willing to take that type of stand for people that it's like, Hey, let's, let's keep the truth. Like what's most true pinnacle around here. Like most people won't do that. There's a big question around how there. Yeah, that the big question that was on my mind is, okay, well, how do I do that? How do yeah. I elicit the, the conversation that needs to be had that people are having with themselves in their own heads that they're scared of having? How would you sure? How would you recommend people do that? Well, you it's it won't work if you're asking people to do something you're not doing. You can pull you can maybe pull that off. It's just not, definitely not sustainable. So the first thing how to do it is to handle yourself with a high standard and be really captivated by self mastery, I would call it. So I really want to know where the gaps are between like my intention as I speak it and my impact. And I'm going to be investigating that if I'm into self-mastery, which I am, I'm going to investigate that regularly, like as often as needed. Like anytime it's awkward in a relationship, there's an investigation to have just to see if what I think I'm up to is actually what they think I'm up to and what I, how I think I am is how they think I am. And there's alignment there. Now, if I do that and I model that and talk about it, with no sense of embarrassment or any kind of like, it's weird or whatever, get off, get over all that. That's, this is how we play the game here is we're always exploring to see what's true, not what's just real. You know, mm -hmm. what's real is like everybody's perception. That's what's real to them. But what's true is what's actually happening in a universal sense. Real time that, data. Right on, right on. Real -time so if I'm data. doing that, and I generate that that's the standard around here. We're not just working here. We're not just doing X, Y, Z. We're actually generating an experience together in which we can be deeply connected and very effective. If I'm doing that and I have a hunch, let's see, your question was how to do it. Yeah, how to do it. First off, I actually have a, I have a, a, so you said, so like what you said, perfect. first commitment to self-mastery yep. and ex exploration of impact in terms of real time data. So, you know, I yep. might have an intention, but I want to know how am I actually impacting you? And is that an accurate sure. restatement? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm of, getting feedback from my people, especially my senior people on a regular basis. And how do you do that? How would you recommend that people get that data or understand what their impact is? Is it yeah. just asking, hey, like, what is my impact on you? Is it is it that simple? It could be. There's lots of mechanisms to get this done. Universally, anonymous feedback is worth nothing. It's actually usually worse than not getting it at all, in my opinion. So I would, you know, if you've not done this yet, start now. Start a culture of transparency. We're not precious over here. You know, and most founders, I love you founders that are listening, you're all really precious and you think you're a special case. It's okay. Everybody can do that. I can do that as well. But if I get over that and don't really live from my ego and I really live from my legacy, if you will, which is where impact sets. Ego it has no concern with impact. It just has concern with how I look from the impact, not that it really worked or were people's lives changed either through my service or through my products. So if I'm committed to that, then I'm going to start, I have this conversation really often. I would, first off, if you're, if you're clear about it, just declare it like, Hey, I'm in a new phase of my life. Like I'm just saying, if I'm a listener right now and I've not done this, great. Here's how you might start in the next senior team meeting is, hey, I'm, I'm in this new era of my life and I'm going to be really rigorous about how I'm doing. And so the way to do that is to ask you guys on a really regular basis, specific questions about what I'm doing that and how I'm relating to you. And if that's opening up or closing down possibilities or, you know, people with that's kind of coach language, but how, how am I as a boss? But then also, I'm sure I'm operating on some 
not perfect thinking. And our strategy isn't when you've got ideas that you haven't been sharing, probably because I either haven't asked you for that or anytime you bring it up and it's not aligned with me, I shut it down. So I'm done with all that and I'm going to be really wide open like never before. I'm still going to be certain of my own opinion. And and what's what's the saying? I'm going to I'm going to speak as if I'm right, but I'm going to listen as if I'm wrong. Mm. So I really want to know. So but here's the kicker. You if you're a leader and you haven't done this up until now, you've trained people to stay underground. So they're not going to come out right away. But if you persistently and as soon as they give you some feedback that's not charming, if you accept that and can can even if you don't agree, you can thank them for the feedback and say, that's great. I'm going to consider that and and then follow up about it because they're probably right. Like if they've given you feedback and they've worked with you for three years, at least at some point their feedback was true. And if you pay attention to how it might be true in the future, you're open to it and you're not in this ego trip. You're actually open to it and you go back and say, hey, Tom, that feedback you gave me six months ago, I saw it in a meeting today whatever. They, and you can affirm that all of a sudden Tom's going to think, oh, this is great. I don't have to be restricted and just complain about you to my wife. Actually, this guy, he's wide open. I would start a conversation like that. Formality in assessments and evaluations is everybody hates it. Nobody fully participates. It's formal. It's tied to money. You don't want that to be the chief moment in which people give you feedback or you give other people feedback. That's Everybody wants to play it safe. Survival is the number one human game. So they hold back and they act like they're holding back for the other person, but they're really holding back for them. So if you stop holding back and start this new conversation, it's going to also give you the space to give other people feedback more regularly. That's probably going to be really helpful. So you model it in that way. Hmm. So I think your question is more mechanistic. So you could start a conversation. You could obviously send people three or four questions and they could email you back. And that's, that's not the end of the conversation. That's the beginning. And then you sit down time to really explore it. Like, tell me more about this. Tell me more about this. What do you think the impact on the business is if, if, you know, if I'm this way and do you know any other impact I've had on other people that they're not saying it's like, Hey, let's get clear. I'm, I am done playing small. I am going to win. I'm playing to win instead of playing to make myself look good and feel good and be right and be in control. You can start that process. So it's never the mechanism. The mechanism never gets the prize. It's the intention that gets the prize. So let's talk intention. What do people need to know about that? So intention is who I'm committed to being. That's what my intention is. So it's, it's, you could slice it into other, what is my intention? What am I committed to? Why? People are really fascinated with why people do stuff. It's fine. It's, we're all moving targets. So that's why I kind of take it like, okay. But then who, who am I committed to becoming or who must I become to get these new results on my team? That's what intention is. As we say, we might've said it in, your, in the latest Revenant, you know, intention plus mechanism equals results. Most people, so results is 100%. If you ask a room, what percentage of results is intention? What percentage is mechanism? Most people will at least say 50-50. Even higher, 10 intention, 90% mechanism. We're captivated by how to get something done. And what's funny is that people don't want the answer because if they did, they would have already had the answer because there's pretty much every issue in business has been seen before. And somebody wrote 10, there's 50 books on it and, and 80 million YouTube. So if we don't actually want the answer, then that means the question on the mechanism is a farce. The deeper question is, why am I resistant to solving this problem, especially if the mm. problem's been happening for six months? If it's happening for six months, it's my friend. It's not my problem because there's something about it that I actually prefer over probably the pain or the suffering that would need to incur for me to solve the problem. It might just be a simple ego thing. I don't want to look good in my people's eyes and I got to be the answer person or whatever, or might have to ask for help, might have to pull in some kind of outside eyes and ears and, and advisory services. We do funny things to keep ourselves looking good in our own eyes. Intention, uh, if I am 100%, by the way, the answer to that intention plus mechanism equals results, my assertion is it's 100% intention because if I'm going to get this done no matter what, then I'll go through 100 mechanisms. It doesn't matter. But if I think that it's a mechanism thing and I put all my chips on this mechanism, if it doesn't work, I'm screwed. 
and we'll we'll stay very faithful to a bad idea just because it was the it was the good idea at some point or I came up with it or we paid some consultant to tell me what it was and so you know that's the mechanism but this is this has to work and we pay we're too persistent in that way instead of more experimenting you know we use this leadership assessment tool called the Harrison it's a, it's a, it illuminates these vital paradoxes and that's that's the innovation paradox uh, is persistence just uh, staying tenacious despite encountering encountering obstacles so it's a good thing and experimenting which is the willingness to try new things if you do both really well then you're in the innovation paradox which our innovation corner top right corner of the of the graph that's where you want to be yeah it's always intention like if something's if if something's going poorly in the business and it's been going poorly for more than let's say a week you like it you might complain about it but you like it why because it's happening it's a pattern mm. and so asking the deeper questions would be like what do I like about what I say I don't want? Most people won't ask that question. They definitely will say nothing. I don't like anything about this. But there's a reason it stays around. So it takes some humility to ask that question. I could give some and examples, but I'll, I've been rambling for a while. No, I, I love, I actually, I was going to say, yeah, like what happens when people ask that question typically? Or, or what does it look like when people ask that question? I would love to hear some examples because I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, what do I like about the things yeah. that, are, that are happening that I say well, that I don't like? Well, let's, let's give an example. I think it'll make more sense. Let's just say I have a misaligned leadership team let's say that's a complaint like these guys they're not working together there's politics going on there, brother. that's my complaint so anytime you want to find out where you're lying to yourself first off start with your chronic complaints what complaint like it's not what it should be this is bad this is wrong broken blah blah, blah. that's a complaint and if it's chronic it's more than let's say a week all right so listen listen to the chronic we even write them down if you want to if anybody wants listening and wants an exercise write down your chronic complaints and then you've been complaining about or even just complaining in between your ears grumbling about avoiding write those down make a list there's probably 10 15 things if you run a business maybe more think about that S second step is there's a system of behavior that actually sustains the complaint like there's things i'm doing that keep the complaint alive so let's say it's my team's misaligned they're politicking they're you know, backbiting, they're whatever, they're holding back information. That's that's my complaint. What am I doing? Well, I've been noticing this for six months and I haven't brought it up. There's a person on the team that's really toxic and I haven't sat down with them and had a conversation. Maybe they're really smart. You know, people do this all the time. They keep really smart, toxic people around because they'll just mm. prostitute themselves and they'll they will suffer. Everybody around them will suffer, but they there's their own honor is out the window because I'm just gonna pay this person to be a tool instead of really standing for them. Oh, I need them. Yeah, I need them. Vital. Oh, yeah. They're vital. They, yeah, they've been here forever. How will the business survive if, exactly. if they're not here? Right on. Right on. So, you know, in that way, you look like a suffering saint. That's good. So if you can take, that's another payoff, hidden payoff to keeping around what I say I don't want is I get to be really strong in my own eyes. I can, listen, we hit 10 million last year and this leadership team is sideways and I'm up not, I'm up till you know, 2 a.m. every day dealing with this stuff. And so there's a huge payoff is this kind of martyr complex and we get to look good. And we obviously talk about that all the time at dinner and with, it, you know, man, my team's tough, man, but I'm holding in. I think I can, whatever, for two years, I yeah. think I could turn these guys. It'll around. get fixed. I'm not doing anything to to fix it, but it'll, it'll get, it'll fixed, get fixed eventually. Yeah, 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 give, fixed. give it time. Give it time. Yeah. Just next year, next year, maybe. Yeah. You get to be a receptacle of other people's complaints. So you get to be significant. That's another big win because if the thing's happening and Tom's a douche and blah, 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 everybody comes to you complaining about Tom and you get to feel feel important for them to do that. You know, you get to like, uh, you don't have to take on the vulnerability losing some or your entire leadership team. Like if you got real and you set the standards like higher than ever before about what it takes to be on this team from an integrity and communication and advocacy perspective, and they might all go. And then, you know, you get to avoid that pain and that vulnerability in your eyes, your investors' eyes, or the market's eyes. That's a big payoff, feeling safe in that way. We, can, we go through, we can make a list of 10 more, but it's like, those are some of the payoffs we get that's just easy off the cuff stuff. I mean, we could really dive in deeper. And in the coaching context, we do just because you got to get it really juicy and get back to the victim responsible story like we did with murderers in prison. Like anytime something's happening, if I'm the leader and something's happening on my watch and I can't or I won't point out how I created this crap or how I've allowed it, then I'm in the victim stance. Mm. Then there's something outside of me that's creating my world. 
if I can do this type of exploration with love and concern, nobody, you don't need to be hard on yourself. That doesn't help anybody either. Just be it real. Lots of grace here. Lots of honesty here. Then the more honest, the more honest we are, the more responsible we are, and the more loving we are to ourselves, then we can be that for other people. And they need that. Most of us are going through life trying not to be the person we're scared of being. So the yes. first part of the exercise is chief complaints. Make chief a complaint. list of the chief complaints. Second part of the exercise is how system, your con system of behavior, system yep. of behavior, how you've contributed to those chief complaints, how right you've on. created, how you have, yeah, set up this dynamic or how you've contributed. How would you say it? Yeah. Yeah. What, what have I done or what am I doing that keeps that complaint alive? What have I done or what am I doing that keeps that complaint alive? Yeah. That's two. Okay. Number three is examining the payoffs I get for living in this complaint. What are the payoffs to that? That's a long, juicy list. Most people say, oh, there's no payoffs, but I pointed out a few. They're a little bit counterintuitive, so you got to look at them with a real honest lens. And I've been doing this a long time, so they're all pop out really quickly to me because there's some patterns here, human patterns. Like the sur survival is the easiest human pattern to see. Look good, feel good, be right, be in control. Well, that's gravity for us as human being. We don't get a vote on that. We come out of the womb, or maybe not out of the womb, maybe, I don't know, six months in when we first get betrayed by our parents, whatever that is in a very small way, we're looking out for ourselves. Look good, feel good, be right, be in control. Those are easy things to look at. Any kind of complaint, there's some kind of payoff in one of those categories. So the last one is prices that I and others are paying for me keeping this complaint alive. Me not hmm. doing the work I know needs to get done in order to have the best experience, the most meaning, the most connection, and the greatest results on our team. What prices am I paying? Usually stress and feeling isolated, feeling really alone. Anybody says we all bought it like 10 years ago when everybody started saying it's lonely at the top. It is distinct and it is you might be alone, but loneliness is a choice. It's a real it's a it's a way of relating and it's and it makes you really special and it gives you tons of license to act outside of your own character. Anyway, we bought into that, but you might feel really alone. It might be lonely and isolated. Why? Probably because you've done things or not done things that you know you and your role ought to do. And so you feel shame mm. about it, which is, it's, it's okay to feel that type of guilt. I wouldn't feel shame. Shame keeps you isolated, but feel guilty about it. Yeah. I, I knew this was going sideways and I didn't say anything. And I stand up here saying, I'm a good guy. I'm not in this context. I gave up on that person. I haven't talked to them about it for two years. He's been failing for two years and I haven't cared enough about him to even open-handedly explore it with him. And I'm busy over here looking like a good guy. Yeah. What happens when people walk through the, this exercise? What, what's on um, the other side of it? Oh, tons of freedom, man. Tons of freedom. Like, Because if I, if I can own my dark side, then you pointing out my dark side is not a problem. It's actually a way to connect because it takes guts for somebody to say, hey, Adrian, I think you're playing small. And if I've already done that and I've done the math and I'm saying, yes, I've been playing small, then I actually trust that person even more, right? So it opens up a whole new possibility of connection with people and related and like relatedness with people. Because if you're doing this work, it sets a whole context of accountability. People love to talk about how do I hold someone else accountable? I say that's impossible. You can't hold someone else accountable. You can like ask them questions about what they're doing and how that relates between the results they claim they would be creating and what they are creating. But someone can only hold themselves accountable. You can give the space, you can give the space that they can give an account on results, but that's personal and talented people. I'm sure everybody listening to this is extremely talented, very ambitious, you know, very intelligent. And you've probably hired really all those people. So everybody knows how to lie and they're really good at it. Like the most talented people are great at lying to themselves and to other people getting away with shit. Everybody knows that. You know that, don't you, me? I sure do. Me too, <laughs> man. I know it. I know I know how to get by with shit. I, I'm good at talking about things and getting myself off the hook. So if you do that and you're done, if you like are done finding ways to lighten the load of existence, that's a weird philosophical way of saying it. But if I just mm. want to get all into it and just look at things as they are with, you'll have to give up the shame combo. But if I just look at it with ownership and love simultaneously, then my world opens up. I'm done hiding. I, now I'm into being and I'm into doing out of that being. So, but what is the importance of, okay, so I hear that possibility opens up when accepting yep. the unsavory shadow 
sure. um, the parts of us that we don't want to look at, so on and so forth. But like, okay, a lot of the listeners, for example, are technical founders, for example, yeah. and they're very like logically minded people. But like, what actually happens? Like, okay, well, so now I accept these like shitty parts of myself. And so what? Who cares? Like, well, well, first, they're not shitty. They're just parts. Right. You know, the fact that we label them shitty gives us reason to avoid them. Number one. Hmm. Number two is we, especially those of us that pride ourselves on being logical, there are so many domains in our lives that we're not logical. We just don't look at those. For example, and I coach lots of technical founders. They are brilliant at generating logical frameworks and structures. They're brilliant at that, yet their team isn't talking to itself. Now, they might say, that's outside of my job, but that the fact that that's happening decreases the chance of success for you and your investors. So is that logical? That's what I would just point out, that there's like lots of spaces in which, because you don't feel comfortable, you call it outside of your realm. A focus, but it's just because you're not comfortable and you're not willing mm. to die, not to die to yourself and like not be the person that has all the answers. And, and you might have to eat some, you have to be the first one up to say, Hey, here's how I'm blowing it. The benefit of it is, is efficiency and effectiveness. People hide b based on their ego and that costs the business time and money. So if you create this context where we tell the truth immediately, and we, if we blow it, we own it immediately. It just saves time and money versus having another two weeks to, you know what, that project's running late. And I said it would be done today, but we need another two weeks. Why do we need another two weeks? Because I'm too proud to ask for help. I, you know, have not been focused on it and whatever. Those are the dark sides. They're not that dark. There just is. That's what's been happening. And we have the results based on the way I've been relating to it. And, but that two weeks is worth a lot of money. And if that's a senior leader, it, it's worth a lot of investment in the company of anybody that's below them because they know the guy's lying. They know it. Mm. And so there's trust that's eroded. And so whatever, put a number on it. Let's just say people are 70% engaged now because their boss is an idiot. That, that's costing you money. So if we get to a logical conversation, having the most upfront, candid, I was going to say scrutinizing. like let's It's like it's eating the frog. Yes. It's it's eating the frog. Eating right on. the frog as quickly as you can so yes. that you don't have to just like keep looking at the frog and being like, oh man, I got to fucking eat this thing. Like, That's right. That's right. That's right. That's why we we do our best to convince people that that creating a pattern of working on the business, not just working in the business is what the smartest companies do. So we need to get our senior leadership team together at least quarterly and have a have the most honest dialogue you've had in three months. And it's uncomfortable. We don't have time for this. And that person's not going to change and blah, 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 blah. All of our reasons why. But if you don't have mm -hmm. a pattern, because we're just humans, we're all going to drift back to survival. That's just where human, human beings go. I'm right. They're wrong. End of story. I'm the hero. They're the villain. End of story. That's the way the human brain works. But So if you create a tide that goes the opposite way, it opens up a space in which people can have conversations that they've decided could never happen at work. And what's crazy is if you decide, most people won't, even listeners. Hi, guys, if you're still listening. If most of you won't take this type of risk, it's, and it's okay. That would be normal. And, but usually you're not just because it's outside of your realm of expertise. So it makes sense that you wouldn't wade into waters that you're unfamiliar with. Back to my point on get someone around you that knows how to connect the dots between your vision and what's needed, which is a conversation about relational cohesion and integrity. And if they, if you can create that at work and people know they're actually becoming the person they want to become at work, like they're prouder and prouder of who they see in the mirror, that will change their personal lives. And people around them will love the fact that they work at your company. You'll get all the credit for that. And people will stay. They'll stay where they, where they feel like and might even just know that they're becoming the person that they're proud of, that their kids are running around and they see them and work isn't the problem for the family. Work is the place that dad or mom becomes the best version of themselves. And there's a whole bunch of potential benefits to standing this way as a CEO. And this all comes from that exercise. Who do I want to be listing the complaints, listing the ways, you know, what have I done to contribute payoffs, the price? Is, well, it is can. Yeah. Yeah. So it all comes from that. I don't know that it all comes from that. That's hmm. going to be a process in which if you want to go search for treasure, 
do that. You'll find it. I mean, there's also other big domains of conversation, like getting really crystal clear on vision, which is harder than it sounds and getting a team aligned to that vision because most people don't explore all the st- all the holding points and who doesn't agree and why they don't agree. A leader is usually so insecure about this, just natural. They're so insecure about not being followed. They won't explore the conversation around vision. So that's an essential conversation. The distinction between vision and current reality, that's a like, here's what we, here's who we say we are. Who are we really? If you, if someone had a camera crew walked around the office and interviewed everybody every week, what would they say is going on versus what, what do we say we're about? That's a key conversation. There's lots of them, but you know, being in this domain of asking yourself important, big questions, that's what you must be doing. And then you got to take it from the big questions all the way down into very specific details. Because Usually that's where the pain is. Once we get specific about things, you know, it's not like that the idea of the team's not that aligned. People would say, oh, that's pretty normal. No. How is it not aligned? What's really going on? How, what's it costing us? And from energy for, perspective, stress perspective. Yeah. Bottom line. For a lot of, for a lot of SaaS founders, it's like, I want to grow, but I, you know, I'm not getting more sales. For right. example, I want to hit that next revenue milestone, but I'm not able to hit that next revenue milestone. I want to hit 1 million ARR. I want to hit 2 million ARR so that I can start yep. considering selling my business because I'm tired, for mm-hmm. example, or even the fact that they're tired of, yep. of building the business in and of itself. Well, why are you so tired? Like, yeah. What is contributing to you being so tired and what can you do to shift that? These are often complaints that I hear from from SaaS founders in those, you know, kind of not beginning stages, but I'd say like that messy middle part um, that really burns out founders. Well, I would say, I mean, burnout and just overall tiredness, that that is is equal to the weight of unhad conversations. And that in the recovery world, they say we're as sick as our secrets. Same in our world. Like that that people, whatever we're not talking about, that we're thinking about and not talking about to others because we're talking about it to ourselves. That's where the stress comes up. And that's where the burnout is, just because we we're we're in this conversation, but we're actually in a dozen other ones. And a lot of them are full of despair. Like we don't think it can shift. I don't think I can shift. I don't think that person's gonna shift. So we we're busy making the best of a shit sandwich instead of slowing down and having all those conversations. There's lots of reasons why we don't. But and understandable, but yet that's what's that's the price we're paying. And mm. it's good to think about it logically. Like if I don't, if I don't make a shift, what's gonna happen? Like if we keep on the same tack that we're on right now, and what's gonna happen a year from now? What's it, so there's this problem today. If I don't deal with this problem effectively, how bad's it gonna get? We call that the parade of horribles. It's good to explore that. And it'll motivate you mm. to take a shift. Like, oh man, here's what's here's the hell that's coming. Okay, now I'm motivated. I don't want that. I'm in hell now. I don't want it 10 times hotter. So what do I do? Well, something is better than nothing. Talk to somebody. Talk to you, Omid. You're very skilled and talented and brilliant in this human dynamic era. Talk to Omid. Omid Omid can help you. Talk to us, obviously, if you want to. But get somebody in there that knows the shortcuts. It doesn't have to be grueling at all. It can actually Hmm. be very relieving. I love it, man. This has been really awesome. Thanks thanks for joining. Yeah, flew by. I flew said by. flew by. Yeah. Yeah. Flew by. Flew it's by. Great to be There's with so you, much more that I want to dig into. But yeah, just really appreciative of your of your time today. Just as a as kind of like a cap off the conversation, anything you want to leave people with today? Just that it's worth it. Mm-hmm. It's worth it. You know, we're all gonna die. Uh, we don't know how long we've got. So whatever the risk is, just go for it. And you know, do it wisely. Do it wisely. You know, get some good counsel around you. But regrets. Don't 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 choose regret choose risk yeah love it man cool awesome thanks for joining everyone out there adrian kaler with take new ground his contact information will be in the show notes below make sure you follow him on the channels and as always make sure you follow like subscribe leave us a review leave comments tell us what your takeaways are from the episode if you're still here god bless you thanks for being here it's yeah been a great conversation thank you awesome. adrian thanks Amid. Thanks, everybody. All right. See you, you, buddy. See you next week.